Good morning, church family. We would love if you'd stand and worship with us this morning.
Good morning. You guys could go ahead and be seated. Uh, we are so glad that you guys could be here today. Um, it's always a special time when we get to gather in this place um, and to uh, worship an almighty God. Um, we are um, especially humbled if you are joining us for the very first time today. If this is your first time visiting First Lubbock or maybe you're a returning guest still looking uh, for a church home, we are so glad that you could uh, join with us today. Um, we would really like to get to know you a little bit better. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by you texting the word guest to the number 94090. You can do that right now from your phone. Um, what will happen whenever you text that number is we'll send you back uh, a little information form that you can fill out right from your seat. Um, it doesn't take very long, and all we'll do once you fill out that form is just reach back out to you to say hello and thank you. We're not going to sign you up for anything. We're not going to, to, to automatically you know, start drafting tithe out of your paycheck, anything like that. We just want to get to know you a little bit better. We just want to want to know your story, and we would love to say hello and thank you. And then afterwards, if you're interested in learning more about this church, we can have that conversation. But first, we just want to get to know you. So go ahead and take some time, text that number, and fill out that form. Um, the rest of you, when you guys walked in this morning. You probably picked up a bulletin. There's a lot of announcements in there. One that I want to draw your attention to is one that probably fell out whenever you opened it. Uh, we have Dupree Fall Festival coming up on October 18th. Um, and uh, we need volunteers for that. The way that that, that works is, is, by, uh, is by having volunteers. So if you're available to work Friday, October 18th, we would love to have you um, to help run a booth. Um, you can also still donate candy to that. So uh, be thinking about that. Um, you can sign up on that little form or you can uh, you know, take that home with you and then sign up online at firstlubbock.org slash serve. So uh, th be thinking about that. We'd love for you to join us at Dupree Fall Festival on the 18th. Um, and then uh, every 
every week we share the live stream of the service on our Facebook page. You can go over there right now um, and just click the little share button. Um, take your smartphone, smart device, do that. And uh, whenever you share it, make sure to use the hashtag be where your feet are as Bobby is going to be challenging us um, with uh, another message from his counter-religion discipleship sermon series. So uh, take some time to do that. Um, and then uh, one thing I, I do want to I, I want to talk about is that last week uh, I said whenever you guys stand up and greet the people around you that you needed to shake at least three hands or the Cowboys would lose. Um, and I don't know if you know if you guys know this, but the Cowboys lost, so uh, some people in here are to blame for that, uh, and that's okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different to motivate you. Whenever we get up and greet the people around us, you have to shake at least three hands, and if you don't, then your car won't start. Um, <laughs> So uh, think about that and go ahead and stand up and greet the people around you. you stand and let's continue to worship this morning. Our great God.
What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Guys, in preparation for today's message, I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. We will look in just a moment at uh, verses 35 through 38, and what a unique opportunity it gives us uh, to see Jesus being where his feet are. Jesus being where his feet are. When I read uh, biographies, there's always the anticipation of reading the last words of some famous person. It's always uh, a stark contrast between uh, their observations of life and their observations of what lie ahead as they're contemplating the reality of death. It said that uh, Steve Jobs' last words were, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Karl Marx had a unique opinion about last words. He said last words are for fools who haven't said enough. But probably the, most, uh, probably the most perplexing last words and challenging last words, I guess, come from Leonardo da Vinci. He said, quote, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Da Vinci actually had more unfinished work than he did finished works demanded such quality of himself. He would just quit sometimes and not return to a piece of work that he was doing maybe 12, 13 years later until he had yet acquired that skill set that was necessary to fulfill his, his vision. But I'm more interested in another set of last words, and that's the last words of Jesus. Matthew records his, his last words. It's really a, a, a charge to his, to his disciples. They're gathered together, and he gives to them what is called the Great Commission. These are his last words before ascending into heaven. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Luke heard Jesus saying something very similar in his last words before the ascension. He says in Acts chapter 1 in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So there we, we have it. There's the charge to you. There's the charge to me. That, that is the mission. That is the task of the church. That is why we exist. That is what we are about intentionally as, as a church, as your under-shepherd. I've been trying these past seven years to keep before you a, a one-dimensional theme because that's what I see in the charge of our Lord. His last words are defining words for his church. These are defining words for those who would call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And so that is our one-dimensional mantra as a church, being on mission where your feet are, because we believe from a biblical perspective, again, biblical perspective, that this is the most effective way of the presence of Christ being disseminated out into our world. When we mobilize with this understanding that we are a people on mission, that we are to be the presence of Christ, wherever our feet are, imagine the influence, the transforming power of that. If every Christian understood that was their mission, that was their sole purpose in life, to be an offensive movement mobilized to go out into the world, into the classroom, into the workplace, that wherever my feet find themselves, that in that moment, that is my mission field. I am the presence of Christ in that situation. It would be transformational. And so unapologetically, 
That is how this church is being led. We call staff that have the same understanding of that same kind of ecclesiology, that understanding of the church and the purpose of the church. We will be unrelenting in that pursuit of mobilizing God's people, understanding that we are a people to be on mission where our feet are. We don't listen to external voices. No matter what group out there is trying to tell us this is what we need to be doing, we are not following their their tangent. No matter what parachurch organization tries to solicit our people, tries to solicit our resources and our energy to go do something that they're passionate about, we will not be deterred from our task. We have no difficulty in saying no, that doesn't add to what we're trying to accomplish in our understanding of the church in the world. We will not be deterred. Nor will anonymous notes left in our boxes change our course. Notes left in our boxes around here aren't really anonymous anyway. We, we just turn on the security tape and see who it was. <laughs> no, that's not right. First of all, we, we, we guess who we think it is, and then we turn on the security tape to have it confirmed. <laughs> but we will not be deterred because that's the biblical, not cultural. And it doesn't matter how popular the personality is out there about about some cause, some popular personality that says, this is what you ought to be doing. It will not sidetrack us. We will not give in to cultural peer pressure. We're going to stay on the task of trying to disseminate God's people because we believe that this is the most effective. Listen, every cause that you think we ought to be passionate about We're most effective in dealing with that cause whenever we understand we're to be on mission. Jesus didn't just say, this is what I want you to do. He role modeled it for us. Jesus, in this passage this morning, we see Jesus being on mission where his feet are. Wherever he's he's going, he's on mission. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of harvest to send out workers into the harvest. And so the question, I think, is if we're to, to follow Jesus' example, if we're to be obedient to his charge in the Great Commission, how do we do that? How is it accomplished? How are we most effectively, the presence of Christ, where our feet are in any situation, any time during the day? First of all, if, if you just notice in this passage, it begins with seeing what Jesus sees. We've got to train our eyes to see things differently, to interpret the world differently. Scripture has to be the filtering system for our processing and understanding the world. We allow too many other, we allow too many other voices and authorities, competing authorities, to vie for our eyes and thus our brains. And so a part of this, if I'm going to truly be on mission, I've got to see my world the way that Jesus saw it. It says in verse 3, 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And then that first clause, we see what really drives everything. The first clause of verse 36, seeing the people. People from all walks of life. People from all strata of society. And you see the humility of Jesus in dealing with just not, not some particular people, but all people. He, he went, it says, as he was going through the cities and the villages, he was not a discriminator of persons. What he had to say and what he had to offer and what God is desiring to do is for all people everywhere, not just some people somewhere, not those that just look like me, not those that have the possibility of looking like me. 
But Jesus went to all cities and villages. It shows his humility. Jesus, Jesus didn't go to the popular end of town and set up camp and build a church where there is present the greatest financial capacity. Jesus didn't go and set up on the popular end of, of town where, 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 the, where the fastest subdivisions are going, where the schools are the most popular. Oh, the humility of Jesus. He went, he saw the needs of people and he saw needs in the faces of all kinds of people, not just some kind of people. Jesus was effective because he had, had an awareness. Listen, that's what, that's what it's really about as we're going like Jesus, as we're just going through our day. If I'm really going, if I'm really going to see things that he sees, if I'm going to look at things the way he looks at them, it means that I have to go through my life as a disciple with a situational awareness. Situational awareness means I know where my feet are, I know where I am, I know what's around me. I know my context. I can change my, my messaging based upon my content. Jesus did it throughout the Gospels. You go look at all of Jesus' encounters. He knew, how to, he, knew, he knew where his feet were. He knew his context. He knew how to respond in a way that was appropriate to connect with people and talk with people in spiritual conversations about the things of God. It's about having your head on a swivel knowing what's happening, knowing, knowing where you are. And our task is so unique because it says here that when Jesus was doing, doing the work of, of healing, I, uh, that he healed, it, 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 in the Greek it's the word therapuo, from which we get our word therapeutic. You and I, if we're going through this world and engaging our culture and seeking to be the presence of Christ, he's saying you have a therapeutic presence. We're in a, we, are, we are being thrown out into a world that is distressed. We are thrown out into a world that is aimless. And with our security in Christ and our identity in Christ, he's saying, I want you, I, I want you to be a healer for people. I want, you to have a, I want you to have a therapeutic presence. Did you see what Jesus saw in this passage? People that, that needed healing. Disease, sickness, verse 36, they were distressed, they were dispirited. People with, with no direction. Listen, church, this is, what it, this is what it says to us. That human pain is the, is the material of our mission. Human pain is, is the material of our mission. Human pain is the inroad to talking to people about another kind of life. But you got to see it. You have to have eyes to see, ears to hear. And so if we're going to be on mission like Jesus, I've got, I've got to somehow develop my eyes to see as he sees. But I've also got to feel, I've got to feel what he feels. I've got to feel what, what he feels. I can't wait on a feeling to act. I've got to act my way into a new feeling. I can't feel my way into a new act. If I wait until I feel like doing something, not much is going to get done, frankly. So I've got to act my way into a new feeling. I've got to emulate Jesus so that I can, so I can know what he feels as I'm on mission. It says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a without a shepherd now this compassion is found throughout the gospels you can do your own google search and word search for how many times this word comes up in the gospels in association with jesus at at the grave of lazarus you know when jesus heard that 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 lazarus had died he was moved to compassion Throughout the Gospels, there's these incidents. He wept over Jerusalem. He was moved for the lostness of the sheep. But it's not just, it, listen, it's not just, this, it's not just this chasm he's worried about, uh, that he's worried about breaching. He's not worried about, it, it, it's so much more. It is so much fuller than, than, just, than just missing hell and making it to heaven. It's a whole lot more than that. Jesus sees people wasting their lives. 
He sees people that are, that are distressed, that are dispirited, that are just wandering through life. Jesus is concerned that they're failing to live. Of course, Jesus, what he sees and what he understands is that kingdom life is the only life wor worth living. Kingdom life is the only life that will give you a sense of fulfillment and purpose. Everything else that this world is offering you as far as lifestyle, he said, that's just going to leave you dispirited and, dis and distressed. Ultimately, you're going to be like, like sheep without, without a shepherd. And it pains Jesus to the point that, in fact, the Greek word that is used here for his compassion means that, it, it, I mean, it, it's visceral. I mean, it's all the way into his organs, his bowels, his heart. It means he has a, he has a heart for people. This is something that, that torments the gut of Jesus when he sees people that, that are so distressed and dispirited in life who are just failing to live life with any kind of purpose whatsoever you know if you really want to feel like this it it takes work in our culture because you and I live in a culture frankly that just distinguishes between the haves and the have-nots and I, I and and I'm gonna tell you if you if you sit around if, if your source of information about understanding the world and processing the world in which we find ourselves which we understand our purpose is to be on mission here but if you sit around and just, you interpret life, or you interpret your people through 24-7 Fox News or 24-7 MSN, uh, MSNBC, all, all, these, all these other 24-7 news networks that have their own agendas, it is going to taint your perspective on people. And it will deprive you of feeling for people what, what Jesus feels for people. Because when you feel what he feels, you quit making snap judgments of people. You quit looking at people in their condition, and you start making, without any information whatsoever, just making these snap judgments of why they're in that situation. You don't want to be like the guy that fell into the pit. He's trying to get out of this pit. Different people come walking by. Somebody said the Christian scientists came by and tried to offer him words of assurance. Say, listen, you, you just think you're in a pit. And just kept walking by. And then a fundamentalist came by and said, well, you probably deserve to be in that pit. Pharisee walked by and said, I assume you're a bad person since you're in that pit and kept going. All kinds of, of snap judgments. The IRS agent came by and said, hey, you paying taxes on that pit? <laughs> the optimist comes by and says, well, you know, things could be worse. Pessimist walks by and says, things will get worse. But Jesus came along and had compassion on the man and lifted him up out of the pit. Didn't make evaluations, didn't make judgments. Just saw someone that needed a, needed a help up, needed a hand out that, that would lift them up. And again, human pain is the material of our, of our mission. We've got to stop making snap judgments and putting people in categories of who's deserving and who's not deserving. Let's leave that to God. Let's ourselves, let us as the church, let us default on the side of grace. And leave the, judgment, the judgments to God. Heard a deplorable story in the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi. During Gandhi's student days, he was very much interested in the Christian faith. He was voraciously reading the Gospels. And he saw in the person of Jesus, and he saw in the Christian faith, the, the possible answer to the caste system in their country. Gandhi went to a particular church in his region and asked to see the pastor. And the men that met him at the door said that he wasn't welcome there. You need to go back and gather with people like you. And Gandhi walked away from that, that incident and said, you know, if Christians have their own caste system, I may as well remain a Hindu. To truly be on mission out in the world, to understand that, 
to get disseminated out from the church, to overcome this mindset that the mission is fulfilled inside here, and to understand that we're effective only as we are dispersed out, being the presence of Christ, committed to being the presence of Christ in our community, you got to see what he sees. you got to feel what he, what he feels. But you also have to hear what he says. Interesting turn here in this narrative. It said, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, Jesus, Jesus says the task is huge. I mean, the, it, the, the harvest is hard. What, what my father is accomplishing, it, the, the, the task is overwhelming. We've already seen in Matthew chapter 7 that, that most are not going to be interested in this. Many will take the wide path that leads to destruction. Few will take the narrow path that leads to life. And so as you and I are dispersed out into that kind of world that Jesus is talking about, where more people are interested in the, in the, in the wide path than the narrow, he said, it, it is overwhelming what I'm asking you to do. But here's what I want you to do. I, what I want you to do, the key to this and the key to our mission is prayer. Because you and I are just being asked to participate in a work that God himself is doing. God is the one that brings about salvation. We, we, we are but a tool, an instrument, a resource of, of, of bearing the good news, of being the presence of Christ. But he's saying the way this, this is, we've got we to pray for more workers, people who embrace this, this idea I've been, I'm talking about, people who see this as their task, their mission, not something that's just left for some people somewhere else. No, it has to be all of us where we are. So you pray to the Lord of hearts. Jesus never prayed for the lost. I can't find it. He never prayed for the lost. Jesus prayed for a lot of things, but he never prayed for the lost. The lost are always there. We don't have to pray, oh, Lord, open my eyes, let me see lost people. They're there. You don't have to pray about it. Our concern is being the presence of Christ. Jesus prayed a, a lot of things. He prayed for children. Jesus prayed for his disciples that they wouldn't be tempted. He prayed for their protection as they, as they would engage the world. He prayed for Peter that, that his faith might not fail him. Jesus even prayed that, that the cup, the cup of death and suffering, Jesus even prayed that the cup might pass from him. But he never prayed for the lost. He said, pray for workers. It's only as you pray to God the Father, pray that God will send forth workers, that this monumental, overwhelming task can be accomplished. Are we making it a matter of prayer for workers? That's what we are. We're like ants, worker ants going out. Because I'm convinced that is the only way we make an impact in our community, in our world. And I believe that's how God does it. Let me give you an example. When you're, when you're at the workplace or you're in the classroom and you see someone that, that pretty well captures what Jesus is expressing here, when you see people that are distressed and dispirited, people that just don't have any direction in life, you ever worked with people or gone to class with people like that or been on a team with somebody like that, been in band with someone like that? And you, you see people that just don't have any direction. You know, they just aren't living life. And you feel this burden. Yeah, I'll reach out to them. You know, I ought, to, I ought to start building a relationship with that guy. You know, that guy needs a friend. Do you know whenever you, whenever you have that sense of burden, I'm convinced that it's because someone has been praying to God for someone to intersect with that person. You're sitting in a classroom. And maybe you know a student that's, that's not living the life that he's called to live. Or you see someone, you interact with someone who, who doesn't 
have any understanding of the life of faith at all, what it is to be a Christian. Maybe they have a very poor image of what it is to be a Christian. Maybe they have a stereotypical image of what it is to be a a Christian and a follower of Christ. But you feel this this burden to you know to reach out to this person. You know, maybe go have some coffee with this person. Start building a relationship with that person. I'm convinced that you feel that way because it's some parent somewhere or some grandmother somewhere that is praying faithfully to the Lord every day, every thought, at every thought, thinking, "Oh Lord, just just send somebody." send someone to to intersect with my son, my daughter, my grandson, my granddaughter. That's prayer. Praying that workers, pray for workers to go out in the field. When we give an invitation every Sunday, it's not about building up a head count. I'm more concerned about people who are half-hearted than I am pews half full. In fact, I'll, I'll, take, a half, I'll, take, a, I'll take a half-filled church with whole-hearted people any day over a church full, full of people that are half-hearted. It's not about a head count at the invitation. We're asking you to be a worker because that's what the Lord is asking. We, get, we give a two-pronged invitation. We, we ask you to come when the invitation starts, when we stand and we start singing. We ask you to come if you're a follower of Christ, but you don't have a church family that you're connected with. We ask you, secondly, to, to come to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We don't want you to come at any cost. We want you to count the cost because you're hearing what, what, what it means to be a part of the church. But if you don't know Christ, if you've ever made that decision to follow after him, we're we're praying and we're singing in the hope that maybe this is your day to come forward and say, today, Pastor, I want to follow Jesus as my Savior. I don't know what all that means. I don't know the implications of it. But I know somebody somewhere is praying for me. And I know the Lord's laid it on my heart to come and to give my life to him. We're asking you to come and join us to become a worker so that we might go out into the world and that the few might become many. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for calling us to a task, to a purpose. That the call you have placed upon our life is not just a belief system, but it is a lifestyle of action, a lifestyle of engagement. It is a life that is fully aware of who we are and what we are and what is our purpose. And so, Father, as we come to this time of invitation, I pray for all of us that it might be a a renewal, a refreshment of understanding. I pray for those that, that are followers of Jesus but don't have a church home, that they would sense from a biblical perspective that faith is meant to be lived in the context of community, local community and family together. I pray for those, Lord, that that are contemplating giving their life to you, that right now they would make that decision to follow Jesus. Don't know all the answers, don't know what all that means, but they're willing to step out into faith and to say, today I want to follow him. My life is distressed. My life is dispirited. I am like like sheep without a shepherd. And I want, I want to have a refined purpose. I want to have a pointed purpose in my waking up and in my lying down. So, Lord, we give this invitation to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.